evening. Let's begin. Page 65. 65 in your hymnals. The Comforter has come. Let's all stand, shall we? Page 65. want to, we want you in on this and want you to appreciate what we have. There are pictures on that back table and we found them and Amy is, so there's some on that back table and there are some on the counter in the cafe, which I'm excited about getting our cafe back, Amen. right? So you all be here. We're going to fellowship and enjoy it. But those pictures are pictures of this building. So some of those you may not really understand, but when you look at some of that, there was a building on the front of this building. The building on the front of this building ended here. It actually went farther past this building, and that was the actual up front. There were two garages where they worked on cars. The pumps were way out there by the grass. So that we tore down. That when you see some of that with the big garage doors, we tore that down. And there's a gray, ugly gray building. This was attached to that. It was just a, a storage area. It was gray metal, open studs. The ceiling was all open. And you'll see the back on some of those pictures, you'll see a great big sliding door. That is where the door is coming in. We took that out, put two windows in. And that door. So we just want you to appreciate. We a, a lot of people have said this who've been here, visited, seen pictures. They said, "Man, you guys had a fire, but you didn't lose much." And that's true. We didn't. We I didn't want to rent some strange place. You know, insurance said, "Well, we'll rent you a place with bathrooms and all that." We said, "No, we want outhouses and we want our building." And and so we're glad that we could be here. And you know. 
Some of you, I, I'm not, look, you know me. We bought that ambulance building, and some of you said, oh, why did we do that? March 2nd, the fire. You know, why, why would we? That wasn't the only reason, but God sure knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Amen. So those pictures, we just want you to appreciate. You'll see one of those pictures. Someone, I talked about this, someone donated this big roll of white rubber. It was just white. Right, John? It was just, and we came in and nailed it up with the big, I think the nail heads had big green heads on it. And it was beautiful. I mean, it was. We were like, isn't this neat? We, when that building was like that, we used this building twice. We had a gas leak one time, and we all ran over here. And we had a fire in the attic above the lobby. Some of you forgot about that. We had a fire in the lobby in the attic, and it caused a lot of damage on the outside, but it didn't cause any damage in the lob in the attic area, really. So we cleaned it up, and the, it did more. It just kind of melted the siding on the back of the building. So that happened. We ran over here. Everybody remember that? We grabbed hymn books. I think we wheeled it. Did we wheel a piano over here? I mean, it seems like we did. I mean, we made church, and we had two great services here. I'll never forget that. We really did. So, you know, this is not where we were. And now, literally, actually, what they've done over there is nicer than we had before. So, but this building is very nice. When I brought the owner in here, Tom Fair, he started crying. He was weeping. I said, why are you crying? He said, because I drove a bobcat through that back door. And he said, I filled three dumpsters with all the trash that was in here. When he saw this, he was just literally devastated. So God has been so, through all this, God has been so good to us. So when you look at those pictures, just, uh, um, it's funny how that rubber, it, this building was so nice. Because we, we were in here and it was like the floor was concrete it was a mess and the walls were all open and uh, we put that white rubber up man it was it was so cool now it's just it's so we're having a problem I think God has answered a prayer for Pat Sheets one of the furnaces is stuck on in the auditorium it's 67 degrees oh, in there so hallelujah thank you Pat I'm sure she prayed about that that we could have that nice, cool. At least it works, right? At least it works. Everything is working wonderfully. And, and work. hey, look, you're going to get over there, and here's what you're going to do. How come you didn't? Why would you do that? What, what, well, what about you could be sitting in this building with white rubber walls, and we're going to be over there, and there's going to be things we're still. So that's what we're kind of debating. We This afternoon, right after church, um, We'll let you know, but it could be that we're there Wednesday. I mean, that's very likely. There may not be any live stream, so if you're watching live stream now, you need to get your pajamas on and get here Wednesday because we may not be live streaming. So um, if, if not, but we're trying, so there's a trade out We'll have to lose it here to get it over there. But So there's a possibility. If you come and we're not here, could be the rapture. Or it could be we're over there. So I'm hoping we get that dumpster out of there, too. That thing is full. And uh, But some of you, you know, you can stay over here, walk over there. And we'll try to open all the doors. We'll try to, you know, we want to acclimate as best we can. But um, it's just exciting to see. You're going to see pictures, and you'll, you'll recognize the church before the fellowship hall was there. That was all, there was dirt. Well, if, you, if that fellowship hall is gone up to the main floor, that was all, like if you follow the dirt, the grass from the front of the church, if you would bring all that dirt 
that's what was on the side of the building. So we dug all that out and we cut a door. You okay? <laughs> we cut that door into the church. So the doors going in from the fellowship hall in the fire doors. The two double doors when you're in the fellowship hall going into the basement of the church. When you see those doors on that picture, that's, that'll give you some kind of bearings where we're at. So um, there was a building on the front of this. There was a building on the side of this. So we tore down that side building and tore down the building. We used that building in front, though. You'll see some pictures. I think it was years we used that building in front. We, John did stuff in the garage. We had Sunday school class in the front. was like a showroom where they sold tires. We used that, and it was beautiful. It had beautiful wood, and we didn't know what to do with it, but it was just, it was blocked. We couldn't really make it work where we knew we could make this building work. So I got a lot of flack when we redid this building. They said, this building is crooked. Why would you build that fellowship hall crooked? Well, we had to build that building that way off that building. This building, we could not add on. We could take off, but we couldn't add on or change anything because all of the ground around us is contaminated. So if you weren't here for years and years, we went through behind this building, as big as this building, I don't remember the time frame, they dug a hole. Remember the hole? They dug a hole this deep. It was as deep as this building and as big as this building because there was tanks, storage tanks all around this property. So they had to dig all that out. And I remember once they dug that out, man, you could smell gas. So I said, the guy's digging. Is there oil in the ground? The guy said, yeah, just smell it. Don't light a match. And so they had to dig until they couldn't smell gas anymore. So we went through that long process. The EPA and IDEM had to give us approval, but we cannot, which would be the side of this building, the front of this building, the rear of this building, and I think all around this building, we cannot ever. I had to sign contracts that we would never, ever build a structure on top of that polluted ground. We can't concrete it, we can asphalt it, but we can't concrete. So they, because the day may come where all of that gas comes back in the ground. I mean, I'm asking the people, you know, they're thinking I'm nuts, but I said, I don't understand, you know, what, what, why we can't build. I, I, before I sign this, please, and they're saying, well, you know, that could be so deep and it comes up. And we have to be able to get to it. So I recently saw one of the guys, Tom Farron, another guy used to own this property. But I asked them when this was all done, we got our papers, and we've got folders and files of the cleanup of this property. I don't know if you want to hear this, but I want to tell it. They said uh, they had to pay the original owners if anything ever in in a hundred years, this is what this is what the EPA said. If there's a problem with this property in a hundred years, the original owners of this property, which is not us, are responsible. So they will trade this. They get a federal ID number. This is your government. They get a federal ID number that gets passed. When something happens to Tom Fair, it gets passed to his kids. That number goes to his kids, to his grandkids. That number keeps getting passed so that someone is accountable. Because that was one of our issues when we bought this property, is that we didn't want the accountability of that. We knew it was ugly. So the more we checked in and dealt with these people. So um, anyways, if you say, oh, we ought to do it, there's a lot of things where on this property we're restricted. We're not restricted behind the church. Where, where we went, it was a big deal. That's why when we started building that building, First Source Bank cut us off. 
gave us a hundred grand, said we're not giving you the rest of the money, we want a hundred grand back because you guys are such high risk because of the contaminated ground. And so I don't know if you remember that when we were here, but they literally did that. So we went out, got another bank. They were Lake City Bank, by the way. Uh, did I say those names out loud? First Source and Lake City Bank. First Source dropped us. Lake City Bank picked us up. Should I say it again? First Source Bank dropped us. Lake City Bank uh, picked us up. And, and uh, by the way, when we dedicate the work that's been redone, we're also going to burn the mortgage. Because remember, before the fire, we paid the mortgage off. So there's a lot of those things that are just like, man, so those pictures are fun. They're, they're reminiscent of, of a lot that's happened. You know, when we came here, it was just a whole different story. When you're in our church building, when you look across the street, the garage, the neighbors, the gates of the garage, when they built our building, they met in the garage. And so it didn't start in the garage. It started off town, the block, in a basement. When they moved here and bought this property, that property, they built the basement and they didn't have enough money to finish the building. So for years and years and years, it was a basement and they didn't meet there, they met in the garage. So in order to put the top structure on, they sold the parsonage. That was the parsonage to Burt Gates who's still there. And so they could build the, which is a block building, you can't see that, but it's cement block. And they built that. When we came to that building, which, by the way, was 35 years ago today, 35 years ago, we filled the pulpit. And uh, it was a, uh, it was rough. I, yeah, yeah. Young man in the back with the beard. When the, uh, the contractor came in, he went, there's a room. When you come down the lobby, yeah, y'all, you, you might as well lay down. <laughs> when you come down, and Amy and I were having a marital spat over this, the steps in the lobby and the steps up front by the baptistry, we weren't really sure what to call them. So we're going to call them the lobby steps and the front steps. So you know there's a stairway when you're looking at the platform, Oregon side, there's a stairway over there. When we came, we didn't know what it was. It was just boarded up. So we, we put the steps in. And uh, when the contractor came in, there's a room at the back of the church. And there is a doorway. And there's a door there. And the contractors are like, we've been walking around this building. We're not sure where this door goes. And I said, what, what do you mean? They go, well, there's this door here, but we can't figure out when we go out. So they were going out on the, on the parking lot, and the door is actually goes into the ground. <laughs> but it used to go, when we came, it was, a, it was a hole. It was a big ditch. When we came... The parsonage was right next to the building in the parking lot. And the previous pastor ran an extension cord out that door because they turned the electricity off at the parsonage. So he ran a, an extension cord out that door to the parsonage. And then Mr. Gates came over and said, I don't know what's going on at the parsonage. He said, but that preacher keeps carrying buckets of water out of the basement. So I asked him, I said, what's the water for? And he said, well, they turned the water off. So he was draining the hot water heater and carrying it out that basement because you could go in the basement that, what Ron's talking about, the basement of the par old parsonage, which is up on Linden Road, by the way. If you go to the new parsonage and look that way, there's a house on Linden Road. That's the old parsonage. Are you taking notes? <laughs> so the contractor said, where's that car go? And I said... Carol, Jerry blocked up that doorway and tarred it. And I said, Jerry, that better never leak. He said, it won't. And you know what? It hasn't. So we got a hold of someone and we said, we want to fill that hole in so we can have parking. So they called me and they said, how do you feel about putting an Arby's in there? 
I said, an Arby's where? He said, well, te we're tearing down the Arby's on McKinley, and we'd like to dump the whole thing in that hole. So there's an Arby's behind the church. <laughs> it is. It's, they tore the Arby's down on McKinley, and they buried it. And so there's some stuff in there. People were throwing stuff in there. Bob Newton came to me from Who's Your Tire. He said, hey, I want to put some stuff in your hole. I said, what, what are you going to put in there? Like old tires or, you know, people? So I don't, really? I don't know what's in there. I don't want to know. But that was like a long time ago. It settled a lot. So I'm hoping it's done. So there you go. So when we go back there, I just want you to know some of the history. Someday I'll be gone, and you need to keep up on some of you on what's happening here. Okay? Look, we're gonna, we didn't open yet, so let's open, and then we'll try to move quickly. <laughs> Father, we praise you for what you've done. We've seen you. It's you. It's you. And uh, I know that. Maybe not everybody knows that, but I know that. And I'm thankful that. You're able to do such great, mighty things which we don't know. And I think of that when we came, the four people that were here, they just held on for dear life. And then two got upset and left. And I thought, that's, that's it, that's it. But God, you've just blessed us. I mean, I just think of all that you've done and people touched, affected, saved, helped. Just a lot, Lord. I'm, I'm just glad. Everybody, it's good to hear the town people excited, wondering, how's it going? And are you back in yet? And so, Lord, we just want to do something here that just brings more glory to you. We want to use everything we have, everything you've given us. And if you want to give us more, we just want to use it right. We want to do what we're supposed to do. Thank you for trusting us, and I pray that we will be faithful servants, faithful in every way. Bless our night. We, we sure need you, Lord. Our, our country needs you. But we just need to be close to you, and that's all that matters. Uh, we want you to work. It doesn't matter who's running the country or uh, who is elected, we just want you, God, to get a hold of hearts, get a hold of ours, and may we just pray hard and see you do wonderful, miraculous things because we believe you can. We want to believe you for that. Help us tonight. Help us to see you, to trust you, to follow you, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Page 583, My Country Tis of Thee, page 583.
it's fun. It's fun to remember what the Lord has done. We remind you, of course, in your bulletin, our reminders Wednesday. All the bathrooms work over there. Yeah. I made room in my new office for the porta potty, so if you want to see it, it'll be in my office. I was going to put a bathroom in there. They told me when they're working, man, we, it's all tore apart. We could plumb you a bathroom, man. I said, no. I'm going to get a port potty in here. They thought that was nice. Wednesday, 7 o'clock, we'll be some here, some here. We'll be some here. We'll be somewhere here or there. Just look for us. I don't want to promise anything. You don't know. Who knows? We might be in heaven by then. Right? If the Lord will, we should do this or that. So we remind you July 16th, which is two weeks from yesterday, if you can help us pass out Bible school flyers. And then Sunday, two weeks from tonight, we will meet again and uh, keep you up and get you involved, try to nail down how we're going to do what we're going to do. And then, of course, you'll be praying August 1, 2, and 3, 6.30 to 8.30 Bible school. And uh, uh, you just start getting ready. If you say, I can't do anything, I can make cookies. I Okay, do that. We'll take that. So if you... Uh, if you have a desire, you know, we'll do our best, but it may mean that you just, we may just need cleanup crew, if, you know. that ca- I, you, you get that, don't you, that God thinks as much of that as he does anything. You know, oh, we'll clean up, anybody can clean up. I, yeah, I know, but anybody can wash feet, too, and Jesus did that, said you should do that. So uh, some of that stuff just needs to be done, and... Uh, one more story. Our fellowship hall, when we, before Hoarders was a fad, the people that were in this church where I got here were Hoarders. Because the basement, watch Amy, the basement was full of stuff. Yes or no? Were you here? Okay. And, and you'd walk down the lobby steps that's the only stairway that was there it used to be a wall there was a wall with a solid door it wasn't open like that so we didn't know what was there so we went down there and down the steps and there's no switches I mean it's concrete there's nothing so I finally see I mean it's it's dark down there there's a pole chain light so there's just a light with a pole chain so I pulled the Pull chain. I mean, there's just mountains of junk. And there's a kitchen. The cupboards were like orange. There's a picture of the cupboards. And nothing was enclosed. There wasn't any walls. The fur- Everything was wide open. The furnaces were wide. Just one big open space down there with metal poles and all this stuff. And so we needed to have fellowship. So we moved all that junk to one side. And we put black plastic up down the middle. And pull chain lights. And we set up tables and chairs. And that's where we had. I mean, our, listen to me. And Amy will testify. I got mad when the contractors kept calling the fellowship hall the gym, the gym. I said, hey, have you been in there? Yeah, I go, does it look like a gym? Find me a gym that has crown molding on the ceiling. You know, wainscot and chair, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's gorgeous. If you've not been in there lately, it, it's worth thankful. So, you know, we have a wonderful place there. So I'm just reminding you the days of the black plastic. You know, we thought it was just so ritzy. Ushers come, or before I tell another story. <laughs> we did see, uh, oh, we were seeing Aunt Dot. Pray for our Aunt Dot. She's not doing well. How was she today, Lisa? She, same? Good. She's just weak, 95, 
She's going to turn 95. Anyway, she has a couch like I used to have in my office, but this couch in my old office, which is the music room now, didn't have legs on it. So I, I come to this, you know, I take this church and I go in my office and the floor is painted. Um, it's all cement block and paneling and the floor is painted battleship gray. And there's no window in there. There's a window there now, but there was no window. And there's a couch with no legs, flowered. Remember those old, maybe you have one at your house. God bless you. The old flowered. And it's, it, it, so this couch is in my office, no legs, and an old sewing machine cabinet for a desk. And I thought I was so special. Just remember that when you look at my office now. I feel so guilty about it. We kicked Era out, and I took her office and my office, and we moved her to a nicer office. I did it all for her. <laughs> no, where liars go. <laughs> Lakeside Baptist. So anyways, we're, we're going to get adjusted as quick as we be patient with us would you as we try to we got a lot of readjusting to do we shouldn't because we were been there a long time but isn't it funny we're here I, I was asking Amy as I said is there anything you like about where we're at I'm going to miss that door opening <laughs> that's the only thing I'm going to miss I'm not going to miss y'all standing in there disrupting me <laughs> I'm going to miss uh, you want me to be honest, right? But I'm going to miss that when that door opens and the light glares in you. Even when you're praying, isn't it neat? Somebody's coming in. <laughs> and it uh, gets real bright. Do you peek? I'm gonna, no, no, no. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Ready to pray? Father, tonight we are excited that your plan is perfect. You said that your way is perfect, and uh, that plan and way for our lives is perfect, and we rejoice in that. We don't always get it. We don't always understand it. Uh, sometimes it really is a mystery, but we trust you, and we're glad that you're in control, and we're going to follow you and help us, God, as the psalmist said, that the praise of God would continually be in my mouth. I, I need that. Thank you. Uh, Lord, that we can give. Thank you that you bless us. And we just hope, Lord, that we'll do as much as you want us to do before you come. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Page 64 in your hymnals, Fill Me Now, page 64. Let's all stand, shall we?
Mackenzie is coming to sing. Second Samuel. Please. Second Samuel. Chapter twelve. When a lot of people thought David could do no wrong, he did. Anybody ever let you down? Anybody ever let you down, thought never would? Second Samuel, chapter 12. When David took a break, I don't know the right accusation. He didn't go to war. It says he stayed home, chapter 11. 2 Samuel 11 says he should have gone because the way it's worded tells us, but David, and anytime it says that, it means that that was the wrong decision. Have you ever made the wrong decision? It's okay to make the wrong decision, but you need to do all you can to correct it. You're going to make a bad decision, but you need to see it and repent. Repent. You know, that's a word we're not preaching anymore that we need to preach. Nobody's accountable anymore. Do what you want, when you want, how you want, why you want. Nobody has to answer. David did not go where he was supposed to be. So he's in the wrong place. He's not supposed to be home. God wants you in church. He wants you in church. Say, we're here, don't yell at us. God wants you in church. That's his plan. 
His plan is not, if you feel like it, his plan is, you know, get together. Get together. You know, we've, we've, gotten sloppy just just bear with me a minute COVID made us sloppy it gave us an excuse I mean I still believe in it I'm just saying it, it, it's I'm not anti live stream I'm just anti live stream in no church say we won't watch anymore I'll be here. I mean, it's up to you if you don't want. But, I mean, it's not about that. Because I'm pretty sure 35 years ago, we didn't live stream. We were here, though. We met in the lobby. When it turned cold, I thought that sanctuary was a monster and we couldn't afford the bill, so we met in the lobby. We pushed the piano in there and closed the doors. The bathrooms were in there. That was another fun time when we had church in the lobby. Before we added on to those bathrooms, there was only one door. Now you go through two, in the church part, you go through two doors. When we first came and we were meeting in the lobby, there was only one door. And there wasn't a closer on the doors. You take this story where you need to take it. <laughs> there were no doors on the stalls. They couldn't finish it. When we came, the, the bathroom stalls were wood, painted gray. Somebody must have gave them a skid of battleship gray. But they didn't have doors on the stalls. So the men's bathroom faced the auditorium where the closet door is. When you come out of the double door, there's a closet door. That's how you got into the men's bathroom, right there. And that door wouldn't close sometimes, and some of y'all would walk out and leave the door open. More than once, I heard my name, and I turned around, and, oh, I should close the door. Because someone in there was saying, please close the door. So I would close the door. The woman's was the same. We added an extra door, but there was just one door going in there. So when we met in the lobby, that was quite interesting. <laughs> but that's where we were supposed to be because that's what we could do. David, being home and not being on the battlefield, sees something. He looked at twice. If he saw it once and turned away, we're okay. But he chose to take a second look. And you know that, right? The Bible says every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And that happened to David because he was in the wrong place. Say so he could have died on the battlefield. It would have been better. Would have been better. So he calls for this gal that he can see afar off. And when he said, bring her, they reminded David, and I, I'd mentioned this recently, that they said, she's someone's daughter. Are you listening? She's someone's wife. You can't just take her. But he did, because he's the king. And I wonder if she should have said no harder. So she conceives. David tries to kill the husband. He tries to get the husband before he tries to kill him. He tries to, he plots and he wants to get Uriah to go home. And then he would blame, David would blame Uriah in his conscience, but he would always know. Even if Uriah went home to his wife and a baby was born, David would always 
No, listen, God knows what he's doing. You may think you're getting away with something, but you'll always know. He finally does away with Uriah. And he becomes so hardened. That's what sin does. It just, it just calluses you. Until God had enough and David was ready. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 says verse 1 that God, God sent Nathan. See it? It says, the Lord sent Nathan. The Lord knows where you are, and he knows when to talk to you. He knows when you'll listen. You know this story. What, what a tremendous story. I love, I have a message I want to preach soon on the traveler. And he, Nathan tells David this story. And it isn't a true story, but it's supposed to spark something in David. And David gets so upset. David said this, this story, if it's true, this man, this man needs to die. And then that's where we get the famous statement where Nathan says, thou art the man. David didn't argue. He could have. You know, thank God that we can be sensitive to God, hey? 1 Samuel 24, when they said, kill Saul, and David said, I'll just cut some of his robe off, and that bothered him. This is the same guy. It bothered him to cut off a piece of Saul's robe. And now he sleeps with this woman that isn't his and tries to trick the husband into, into uh, taking on David's sin. And then David ultimately kills. He killed, look, he killed. And David said that you killed Uriah. It's amazing what sin will do to you. That's why you ought to stay away from it. Hey, if you're not in sin now, you're not missing anything. You need to stay away from it. Better men, I haven't said it lately, it needs to be said. Better men than I have fallen. Great preachers. Men of God. Tremendous, tremendous spiritual giants. Fallen. We need to be careful. We need to be careful. Verse 7, Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Verse 5, just back up a bit so you can see the context of this. As Nathan tells him the story about this traveler, this wayfaring man, he said that the rich man took the poor man's lamb and cooked it, verse 4, for the man. And it says, see it, verse 4, for the man. Verse 5, David's anger against, verse 5, the man. And he says, as the Lord liveth. Why did all of a sudden David care about the Lord? Why all of a sudden would this untrue, fake story... Get David all wound up. Did you ever watch something that wasn't true? We talk about old Yeller. Did you ever cry when you watch some of these shows? And then I'm thinking, you know, if they didn't have the music, we'd be laughing. But some genius puts it, I mean genius, puts his music to it. And it's music. And it's not true. You know, I mean, come on. Bambi. You know, a deer. Nathan, verse 7, says to David, Thou art the man. The man you're mad at. 
you. The man you're, you're ready to kill, that you think should die, you're him. And then he quotes God. He says, verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, I gave thee, verse 8, I gave thee thy master's house, thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah, and if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Do you hear what God is saying to David? You took something you didn't need. You ruined your life and you marred my name because you didn't come to me to get what you needed. Watch what he says here. Verse 9, he says, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword and has taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore, verse 10, now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised. That means there, he uses it twice. That means you've given what I've said the lowest opinion that you could give it. What do you think about God's word? Eh, I hope if someone asks you what you think about God's word, you say, it is perfect and holy, and I try to follow it. But David said, eh. So God said, you have despised me. Verse 10. You have despised me. You've, given, you, you've, you've taken the wife of Uriah to be thy wife. Verse 11, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Now watch. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, I would have said, big time. In other words, David, did you just hear what God said? He's really ticked. Don't you think God is ticked? That's a Hebrew word. Don't you think God, I mean, I'm, the sword will never depart. Hey, God said some rough stuff. God's mad. Say it. God's mad. He, he doesn't mess around with sin. God's mad. So Nathan says, The Lord hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Remember, his first, his first judgment against the guy that took the lamb was, this man shall surely die. So Nathan says, you're going to pay for this, but you're not going to die. And I got to tell you, I don't understand all of that. I know I'm forgiven, but God can't just let me off the hook. Do you understand? Watch what he says in verse 14. We're stopping there. This is where we want to focus. He said, how be it? He kind of explains. He, you know, Nathan's God's man. He's trying to help David through this. He says, how be it? Because by this deed, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Heavenly Father, I just don't think about my decisions and the ramifications or the consequences. I just think about what I want, and that's exactly what David did. He didn't think about how it could affect his family. He didn't think about how it could affect his God. He just thought about what he wanted. Lord, I don't know who needs to hear this. Maybe it's just for me. 
Maybe it's for just one person here. But I do know it's your word. And I'm confident that it's helpful. It, it's brutal. We've read some brutal things. Serious. Harsh. The sword shall never, you said, depart from his house. Wow. That, that's harsh. You're a holy God. Help us to see how important it is. To not make it easy. Not, we cannot give the enemy any opportunity to blaspheme God. And this is for us tonight, Lord. It, it ought to be for a whole big, huge group, but that's okay. We're enough. Speak to us. Speak to us. We, we can use it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I need you to see these verses. So I need you to, I, I, I'm sorry to put you through so much heartache and work, but I need you to look these verses up with me. Would you do that? First, first verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because we could just stay and I know I can do it and, and it's easy to criticize. Oh, you took one verse and you didn't bring up any other. And there's a lot of verses. I mean, I mean it, all, it all weaves together. But, but for the sake of this message, I need you to see, along with what we've read, there are two verses, and they're both in the New Testament. First one is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And as Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he instructs them regarding the Lord's Supper. And in that passage, verse 23 and following of 1 Corinthians 11, likewise, there's harsh language. He said, verse 29, look at it. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh Damnation. Not a cuss word. If you disregard, if you despise, if you will, if you put a low opinion of God and his work, that's what the Lord's Supper is. We're just exalting that Jesus died and he rose from the dead and that's what we needed and we always need that and we're glad he did it. So we have the Lord's Supper. And someone would say, well, how can we have the Lord's Supper while we're here? I'm just not comfortable with it. I mean, we're going to do it, you know, when we get back there. Don't worry about it. Don't get all bent out of shape. Don't leave over that. If you want something to leave over, I'll give you some good stuff. He said, verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many, many sleep. That means they're dead. Not some, many. Many are weak, sickly among you, and many are dead because of that. That's severe. That's harsh. He said we have to make sure, verse 31, that we judge our actions. For if we judge, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Look at verse 32. This is the verse. Watch this. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. This is what's happening to David. It's not over the Lord's Supper, but it's about despising God. And that's what Paul is talking about here, despising the Lord's Supper. So Paul writes, verse 32, 1 Corinthians 11. He said, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be, watch, that we should not be condemned with the world. Very important phrase there, condemned with the world. He said God comes after us and chastens us and corrects us and is harsh on us because he doesn't want us condemned with the world. 
You with me? Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. You have to put your thinking cap on. We read some of this and we think, oh, oh, oh. What, what's the big deal? My dad used to say, I'd watch my dad. My daughter would get on him. Amy would get on him. He didn't look at women right. He's always talking about going to Hooters. And that, that was offensive to me. It's my dad. He would say, whoa, whoa, there's nothing wrong looking. And I would always say, but that always leads to something. So if you don't look, it's not going to lead to anything. So quit looking. Oh, you Baptist. No. Hey, you with me? I mean, but he didn't get it. He's lost. So we read Hebrews 11. God gives instructions to Noah. I want you to build this ark. I'm sure that Noah said... How long do you think this will take? God is saying at least 100 years. Can you imagine? Huh? 100 years. I mean, there are some people, right? Turn 65, I'm retiring. Not Noah. I mean, he's already up there. He's over 65. So God, you know this story, right? Build this ark. We're not talking about building a model boat. We're talking about building a huge, I mean, a, a ship. Verse 7 says, look at verse 7, Hebrews 11, by faith. I mean, no blueprints, no computer, right? No nails. You got to make your own nails. You gotta make your own screws. It can't leak. I mean, could you see Noah laying in bed at night? <laughs> Going nuts? I wonder if I did this right. But God commissions him to do this. Verse 7 says, By faith, Noah being warned of God. Of things not seen as yet. God said, build this boat. I'm going to send rain. I'm going to flood the earth. I'm going to kill everybody. But who's ever in the ark with two of each animal, they'll all be safe. Noah goes, watch, Noah goes, all right, would you? What you say? Say that again. How big? I would be saying, I mean, the ark was, wasn't it 400 feet long? That's four churches. If I said build the church, you got 100 years. He built this gigantic boat, stories high, wider than the church. He's going to get animals in it. It's got to float. I mean, it can't. If I built something, it would not be straight. It would float like this. And I would say, lean. Keep it level. So Noah's got to do all that. How do you keep all the animals on, on, on center? You know, how do you say to the camels, you can't all go over there? I mean, there's a lot of issues here. It isn't just build a boat, everything will be okay. I mean, this is 20, 30 years ago. But it says there, moved, verse 7, see it, he moved with fear. What fear? Fear that he didn't do what God wanted him to do. Fear that he'd let God down. 
He didn't fear judgment because God said, you build the boat, you be in the boat, you'll be okay. He didn't fear the judgment. He feared not doing what God wanted him to do. He moved with fear. He did it because God is God. And it says there, verse 7, as he's building this ark, he prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the witch. Don't look, don't read, don't read, don't read, don't read, don't read, look up. They walked by. They looked. What's she building? An ark. For where? It's not like the one that isn't in water down in Kentucky or wherever it is. This one had to be in the water. And he said, well, I mean, how much do you say? Do you say, when they say, what are you building? Don't worry about it. Well, the Bible says that he was a preacher of righteousness. So he said to people, hey, glad you asked. God's going to send rain and flood the earth, and y'all are going to die unless you're in that big boat. Do you think people said, wow? Or did they say, goodbye? <laughs> I mean, he didn't have a lot of support. Because I'm pretty sure the ones in the ark were the ones that supported him. And there wasn't two dozen. But God tells us and wants us to know that as he did that, what did he do by building the ark and believing God and moving with fear? Look at verse 7, Hebrews 11, verse 7. By the which he condemned the world. He condemned the world. He said, you don't have to believe it, I believe it. You think I'm nuts, I think God is right. You think that you could do without God, I'm moving with fear. It says there that he condemned the world, look at verse 7, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Keep those two verses in mind, along with the story of David. We, we, you and I, if we're born again, we belong to God. We don't belong to the world. In fact, he said, and be not conformed to this world. The world belongs to the devil. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, is not of the Father. And Nathan has reminded David in 2 Samuel that his actions, his behavior, his decisions, has failed to reveal God to the world. So David did not condemn the world. He was condemned with the world. He looked low. He had a low opinion of God as Paul writes to the Corinthians that they despised, if you will, the Lord's Supper and and they now have become condemned with the world. And God says, hey, but Noah, man, Noah built the way and Noah believed me. And I don't know about you, two, three years of building that big boat and not a lot of progress. I mean, I'm going to die building the ark. I might as well die in the flood. But notice in that verse, in that chapter, God twice says of Noah, by faith. By faith. God won't change because of what you do. God doesn't change because of what others say, because of what we've done. When people thought of David, they thought of a giant killer. Hey, 
Hey, if you've got a giant in your life, man, David believes God like nobody. We saw a whole army. A whole army. Go coward. And David, as a young boy, just steps right up and takes out Goliath. In fact, the Bible says that he could beat a giant, but he couldn't control where his eyes went. This glance. Hey, isn't it amazing what your eyes can do? Huh? Huh? Your eyes. Isn't it amazing? One weak moment for David, he's slain by, by a glance at a woman that didn't belong to him. Do you know sin does not belong to you? That's why it says, Hebrews eleven seven that Noah became an heir of righteousness that belonged to him. The world didn't belong to him, but righteousness did. So Nathan is saying, man, you became an heir of this world. God means for you to become an heir of righteousness. So now you've given God's enemies the opportunity to say, God is not a good God. God has let you down. God must, must not be worth serving. You see, the enemy, listen, the enemy sees God by how we live for God. And the enemy sees how we fail to live for God. They're watching. Don't think they're not watching. I had someone today I've never met call me by name. Amy and I were talking about on the way to church. I said, that scares me. That somebody knows me, but I don't know them. You know why? They're watching. Amen. So maybe they don't like you. That's not the point. They still know me. And I have to make sure that God looks good by what they know of me. You can live any way you choose. But I'll remind you from this story, 2 Samuel 12, that how you live, how I live, is a reflection on how God's enemies view him. That's why God's so upset here. God said, David, you didn't just get what you want. You turned a lot of people off from getting me, from wanting me, from having me. You've made them think that you should just get whatever you want. That's not how God works. When this happened, all those that knew David forgot all about, listen, listen, they forgot all about how he killed Goliath. The baby died. You know the problems he had with his kids. They weren't thinking about his, his great victory over Goliath. And neither is he. They forgot. The people that were watching David now that are close to him, they, they forget all about how many times he defeated the Philistines. Remember what they said of Saul? He slain his thousands. You know what they said of David? He slain his tens of thousands. That to them was uh, the unlimited number. They also forgot about the times that David could have killed Saul, but he didn't, and he had enough control not to kill his enemy. But he sees a woman, by the way, by the way, are you listening? I think he had a couple of wives. It just shows you that sin is never satisfied. And that's why Nathan, God through Nathan says, what, what a statement. If that had been, look at verse 8, if that had been too little. I didn't realize God talks like that. He said, if that had been too little, I would have moreover given unto thee such and such things. And God says, just, you, you, 
follow me, obey me, trust me. I'll take care of you. And you know what? The sin doesn't bring the satisfaction that God can bring us. God's reputation. When God chose David, God's reputation was on the line. God delivered David. When Saul wanted him dead, God wanted him alive. Isn't that, that David's thinking, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And I really believe when he wrote Psalm 23, he thought he was going to die. And he, and he made everything, and he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm going to die. Isn't it amazing? God spared him. He can do that. David said, this is it, this, it's over. The Lord is my shepherd, he making me die, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm, this is it. I mean, he's preaching his own funeral. Psalm 23 is his own funeral. I mean, he felt it was all over, but he learned and he knew that God could preserve him and God could protect him and God did deliver, and God said that. He said, verse 7, I anointed you king over Israel. I trusted you. He said, verse 7, I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. You, you could have been dead. I delivered you. David wasn't that slick and that God. He's saying, look, don't think this was all you. David, I did this. So God sees David's choice to take Bathsheba as a deliberate choice to side with evil. I, I'm trying to make you sound worse than you are. You are bad. But I want you to think you're really, really bad so you'll be really, really good, okay? I'm not supposed to tell you that. But that's where we're at. I, I don't think any of you have done that or would do that or are close to that. But God reminds David through Nathan that he now has given the enemy an occasion to blaspheme, an opportunity to despise God, to have a low opinion. And he used that word twice. He used that word in verse 9. He used it again in verse 10. He said, now, because you've looked down on me, you've looked down on what I've said, you know what's true. David knew it was wrong. That's why he kept it a secret. So God is saying, now, now you've made it easy. You've given an occasion, an opportunity to the enemy to, to have a low opinion of me. That's the opposite, by the way, of glorifying God. And we're supposed to do all to the glory of God. Every sin we commit is an occasion for those that don't serve God to keep from trusting Him. When you, when you sin, I'm talking to you like you're sinners. Maybe you're not. When, when you and I sin, hey, we are moving away from God. That's not God's plan. God isn't like, oh, I'm so glad they're moving away from me. Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh. No, he wants us to move closer to him. So sin is just that which pulls it. We're drawn, James said, we're drawn away. The enemy's watching how you live. Now get me, and I'm, I'm through. The enemy's watching how you live. The, the people that are lost, the people that want to fight you, that don't agree with you, that have a low opinion of you or God, they are watching how you live. So in order for us to win those enemies, we need to see that we need to be at battle. This all started in verse 1 of chapter 11 when David decided, it says, to tarry still. When you forget that you're at battle, 
you're going to do something you shouldn't do. When Peter says, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the dead. Peter's speaking from experience. He's not telling you what God told him. He's telling you what he went through. I'll never deny you. I would never do it. I'll die with you. He didn't really go to battle against the devil. I mean, Jesus said, oh, let me, hear, let me help you. You're going to deny me. I mean, wouldn't a normal person fall down at the feet of Jesus and say, I'm not going to let go of you? What did Peter do? Tells us he followed afar off. Sin in the life of a Christian. Sin in the life of a Christian pushes the enemies of God away from God. I don't want to have to answer for giving God's enemies an opportunity to mock him. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I don't know what's in your life. I'm not calling you a sinner. I'm just warning you that every decision you make could cause the enemies of God to have a bad opinion of God. And I want my decision. They don't have to agree with them. I just don't want them to have a low opinion of God. Watch me now, and I'm through. When they see me, I had a guy ask me, I was shopping, he said, could I ask you a question? He said, and he looked at me, and I could tell I was kind of dressed up, and so he looked at me, and I knew what he's going to say. So he said, but it didn't, he didn't say what I thought he was going to say. He said, are you a teacher? I said, I'm too smart to be a teacher. I said, why, why no, I'm not. He said, well, I was. And he never asked me what I did. And I, I, was, I couldn't get a word in. I felt like I was talking to myself. <laughs> you don't have to laugh at that. I have feelings. My wife's leading the pack. Let's just go home. Hey, I said before I left, I said, thank you. I said, I put some of my teachers through H-E double toothpicks. And I said, I appreciate teachers. I said, that was an honor and flattering that you thought I was a teacher. Kind of gave me that weird, you know, we don't do that, do we? We just, we don't care about anybody. We don't thank anybody. We don't hold the door open. I want people to have a high opinion of God. I want them to notice that I don't drink. Because I don't need it. Because God said, as he told David, if that was too little. Hey, if that was too little, I would have given you. So I just go, God, I don't want to sin. Hey, hey, can you hear it again? Can, would you please listen to it again? Better people than you and I have fallen into deep sin. We have to be careful. We just have to make sure that we're at war and that we are representing our God as best we can. Can you do that? I believe you can. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, we come to you tonight. We are honored to be an heir. You called Noah an heir of righteousness. I want to be an heir. I want to inherit the righteousness that comes by moving with fear. I don't want to look down. I don't want to mock. I don't want to despise you or your word or what you've done for me. And you said when you do that, you're just condemned with the world. You look just like the world. You, you got coming what they got coming. Lord, I don't want to do that. I want to be like Noah who, who was so obedient to you and, 
and so faithful to you that he condemned the world. His life, his actions was like judgment upon the world. I want to live like that. I don't want to judge them. I just want to have faith in you and, and do what you want and move with fear so that my life gives the highest opinion of my God that it can give. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. We're going to leave, but before that, you might say, hey, preacher, I, I just need to realize, I need to realize I'm always at battle. I always need to be sober, be vigilant, because my adversary is just waiting for an opportunity to devour me. I just always, I, preacher, I, I'm praying that I'll always realize I, I, there's a battle. And then, preacher, I want to make sure that my life condemns the world that how I live and my obedience and my righteousness makes the world what they are and shows them what they are, condemns the world. I don't want to be condemned with them. I don't want to look like them. I don't want to be guilty of what they do. I want my life to really reveal that they are that evil and wicked and sinful. So preacher, I want to be in the battle and be at battle and do the battle God wants me to do, and I want to just move with fear in life and live like he wants so that he looks like he's supposed to look. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Here's my hand. Raise it high. Here's my hand. Here's my hand. Preach, I, I need to do that. I need to do that. If you don't do it, here, here's my hand. I don't want to keep saying that, but you just say, yeah, I'm in, I'm in. I'm here, here, I'm in, I'm in. Father, please tonight help us to see the the seriousness, the 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 uh, awesome responsibility we have. A lot of people knew that David wasn't with them, and he should have been. Boy, he did a lot to cover up what he did. And I'm sure a lot of people were suspicious. And for almost a year, he hid from it and avoided it and ignored it and you sent your man and David David confessed to it but he still did it and he tried to hide it and he tried to cover it up and we don't know what would have happened if Nathan didn't show up but you had had enough God, I don't want you to ever get fed up with me. I know I'll always be your child, but you, you were disappointed in David. In fact, you said, boy, now you've just given my enemies a chance. They shouldn't have the chance, but you've given them the chance to blaspheme me. Oh, God, I don't want to be guilty of that. There are a lot of preachers that have done that. They've stolen money. They've gotten drunk. They've cheated with women. They have given the enemy that occasion to blaspheme you. Help me, God to be in the battle, to stay in the battle. Help me, God. Oh, please, help me, God, to realize that my choices, my decisions need to be such that God looks as great as he is, as great as I can make him, not despise him. Work on hearts tonight. If we need to repent, help us repent. I pray this in Jesus' name. Piano's going to play. As you stand, make that decision. Make that decision. Come on, come on. She's playing. You're standing. Make that decision.
I, I just, I hear the heartache in God's voice when he tells David, I could have given you so much more than what you thought you could give yourself. She's going to play. God speak in your heart. Don't, don't fight him. Remember, God told him, I, 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 I picked you, I chose you, I delivered you, I gave you so much. And if that wasn't enough, I was there for you. I would have given you more. Man, let's just go to God. Let's stay in the battle. And then if we're wrestling with something, don't try to get it. Don't think it's going to help us or satisfy us. Just run to God and say, God, help me with this. As Paul wrote in Romans 6, we can't yield our members as instruments of, of unrighteousness. We have to yield our members as instruments of righteousness. God will help you. we got to run to Him. Run to God. Run to God. Let's pray. Father, we come to you tonight. You know us better than we know us. Help us to be in the battle. Help us, Lord, to make sure that whatever we need, we get from you. David thought for some reason he needed another woman. In fact, it didn't bother him that that other woman was somebody else's wife. Boy, his thinking was just so off kilter. Help us, Lord, to honor you. And you just said, David, you just despise me. You just despise me. You despise my word. You despise me. You have the lowest opinion of me you could have. God, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to have a high opinion. I want others to have a high opinion of you by the way I live, by the way I talk, by the way I dress, by the way I, I uh, work. By everything I do, I want to just give the highest opinion of you. Help me, God, help me, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Be careful with your...